we finished up Revelation chapter 6 to end our last lesson. So we're going to review it to get our foundation set for the fascinating chapter 7 that we're going to study today. Six of the seven seals that sealed that secret scroll have now been opened by the Lamb. And we see that the nature of the contents revealed by each seal varies from one to the next. The first four seals represent what is classically called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, each horseman acts as an instigator of war and violence among humans. And it is questionable among Bible scholars as to whether these four horsemen ought to be classified as instances of God's wrath. Now, my belief is that these represent satanic influence upon the human evil inclination. It is that God has relaxed his constraints, if you would, that he had in place upon Satan such that mankind can now be more deceived than ever towards doing more wickedness than ever. Therefore, what is playing out is not God's wrath, not yet, but rather a great increase in tribulation. And I define tribulation as man's inhumanity to one another. The breaking of the fifth seal in chapter 6 revealed countless martyred souls in heaven said to be living underneath the altar who cried out to God to avenge their blood. And while we tend to think of avenging more in terms of revenge upon someone for their offense against us, that's not what's being envisioned here. Rather, this is a call for God to administer His justice upon those who murdered these believers on account of their faith in Christ. And the Lord assured these martyred souls that, they, that He would administer justice, but not now. They would have to wait until the full number of all those who would be martyred in future times Till they were accounted for too. And as with the first four seals, we don't see God's wrath present in the breaking of the fifth seal. Rather, the fifth seal seems more associated with the first four seals, whereby humankind's evil is prodded on by satanic guidance, and one of the outcomes is this substantial spike in the murdering of Christ believers. Well, the sixth seal is broken, and the effects of it are quite different than the first five. The first five have to do with an increase in chaos among humans, but the sixth seal represents sudden chaos in nature. Thus, a great earthquake happens. The sun turns dark, the moon turns blood red, stars fall from the sky. Now see, it must be recognized that how the ancients of the first century thought about what went on in the skies and in nature is quite different from how we of the 21st century think of those same things. See, the various... When John received this vision, and then he, he told others about it, they would have viewed this as a disruption of harmony between the heavens and the earth. And it would have been seen as a bad omen. So all of these different God systems, pagan god systems that were around. Okay. They had as their chief goal living according to the, to the divinely ordained structuring of the universe. 
So the various gods in their systems were each responsible for kind of a segment of that universe and its, and, and, and its structure. And when a natural event, like a storm, or maybe a cosmic event like a solar or a lunar eclipse occurred, well, the people's response was to try to appease and then worship the God associated with that particular event in the prescribed way so that this, this natural harmony of the universe could be restored. Therefore, should these foretold events of the sixth seal have happened in John Zira, that's how the earth's people would have thought about them and responded to them. However, in modern times, our response to the disruptions of nature would not be to see them in a spiritual light. We would see it as one of cause and effect. That is, particularly in our age, reckless human behavior towards the environment will be seen as the inevitable cause of the disturbance of normal patterns of weather, climate, food production, sea level. As for the disruptions in the cosmos, these too will be seen, not will not be seen rather, not be seen as spiritual indicators, but rather as unfortunate but all too real events that will be explained in purely scientific terms. And in fact, most commentaries on the book of Revelation seek to explain and define these horrific events that we read about in Revelation in natural and in scientific terms as opposed to God supernaturally orchestrating them. So the wording of verses 12, 13, and 14 do not mean that these catastrophes happen all at once. Just as with the plagues of Egypt, they will happen one after the other, but with a lull in between each of these terrifying cosmic events, and not necessarily will they happen in the precise order that Revelation presents them. For the believer of John's day, and, and for ours, the fact that these devastating events are predicted in advance and they happen in what is a, a, a relatively short period of time can only indicate that they are the result of God's supernatural wrath. Thus, to my thinking, the sixth seal may represent the first actual acts of God's wrath that we've read about in Revelation. I acknowledge that categorizing, labeling things like wrath and tribulation is a little bit dicey, since our definitions tend to be human-centered and might not fit God's definitions. This is demonstrated by the fact that Bible academics have come to no consensus about these definitions or their categories either. So although I feel fairly confident in what I'm telling you, I wouldn't be saying it, since we're discussing unfulfilled prophecy, it is always wise to take any teaching you receive on the matter with, with a grain of salt, including mine. A part of the reason that I'm confident that the sixth seal represents God's wrath as opposed to just human evil running wild is because verses 15 through 17 of chapter 6 say so. There we read, Then the earth's kings, the rulers, the generals, the rich and the mighty, indeed everyone slave and free, hid himself in caves and among the rocks and the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of the one sitting on the throne, and from the fury of the Lamb. For the great day of their fury has come. Who can stand? 
Note, by the way, that this fury or wrath is coming from two sources jointly. The one sitting on the throne and the Lamb. Or perhaps more correctly, while this wrath is from God, it is also in agreement and cooperation with the Lamb, the Messiah. It can be hard for Christians to square the image of a mild and meek Jesus that offers nothing but love with the furious Lamb of Revelation who is complicit in pouring out the Father's wrath on the universe and on humanity. Most of this difficulty comes from man-created doctrines. Doctrines that deny the full character of Yeshua and instead want to depict Him as the New Testament God who dispenses only love and mercy. Here we see the other side of Christ's character as He doles out wrath. Wrath that's intended to cause terror, intended to cause calamity to humans on earth. Well, verse 17 ends with the pronouncement that upon the opening of the sixth seal and upon the unparalleled cosmic disturbances that pummel the earth, killing untold millions and causing even the greatest warrior leaders among us to wish for death rather than trying to endure all these events. This is the official beginning of God's wrath. So let me emphasize that should we believers still be here on earth when these catastrophic things start happening in the skies, <clears throat> then we can confidently mark that day on our calendars as when God's wrath, as described by John in Revelation, and by the other biblical prophets began. Let's move on now to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Open your Bibles, if you have a complete Jewish Bible, to page 1539. 1539, if you have a complete Jewish Bible, we're going to read Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the land, on the sea, or on any tree. I saw another angel coming up from the east with a seal from the living God, and he shouted to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard how many were sealed, 144,000 from every tribe of the people of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Shimon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Yisachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin, 12,000. And after this, I looked. And there before me was a huge crowd, too large for anyone to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language. And they were standing in front of the throne and in front of the Lamb. And they were dressed in white robes. They were holding palm branches in their hands. And they shouted, Victory to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. <clears throat> All the angels stood around the throne, the elders and the four living beings. And they, they fell face down before the throne and they worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. 
one of the elders asked me, these people dressed in white robes, who are they? Where are they from? Sir, I answered, you know. And then he told me, these are the people who have come out of the great persecution. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. That is why they are before God's throne. Day and night they serve Him in His temple. The one who sits on the throne will put His uh, Shekhanah upon them. They will never again be hungry. They will never again be thirsty. The sun will not beat down on them, nor will any burning heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will shepherd them and will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, the first words of this chapter are after I, or rather, after this I saw. Those words represent an immediate point of departure for Bible scholars due to the variances of their adherences to one particular predetermined doctrine or another of the timeline for the events of Revelation. Now, for the pre tribulation dispensational folks, in order to make their timeline of the end work out, chapter 7 has to be declared as out of chronological order. The most typical explanation for this anomaly is that chapter 7 is essentially a parenthesis, and it's inserted to explain how it is that God will keep His believers from having to experience the trauma of the event that they label the tribulation. Now, the evidence, their evidence for chapter 7 being out of order is this, that we find only the first six of the seven total seals on the scroll being broken in chapter 6. But the seventh seal isn't opened until chapter 8. So chapter 7 sort of gets in the way of directly going from seal 6 to seal 7. So chapter 7 then represents a stoppage of the natural flow of opening the seals. So the pre-tribulation view is that chapter 7 depicts what happens chronologically before the events of chapter 6 happen. Therefore, what we call chapter 7 ought to be placed before chapter 6. What's the agenda or motive for wanting to move chapter 7 and place it before chapter 6? It is that if we go by the chronological order as we find it in Revelation, then we also find the church going through the so-called tribulation instead of being rescued from it by means of rapture before it all starts in earnest. This is because only after the events of chapter 6 that the pre-tribulation doctrine labels the tribulation do we find in chapter 7 the sealing of the 144,000 and this enormous multitude of Christ followers who are the ones dressed in white robes? And these are thought by pre-tribulation adherents as, though, as being those who were raptured away before the beginning of the tribulation. Bottom line. If we take chapter 7 and we move it to before chapter 6, then the pre-tribulation pre doctrine works chronologically. If we do not agree to that, then the timeline doesn't work. To be clear, I'm not saying that it's impossible for the pre-tribulation folks to be right. However, such gross restructuring of Holy Scripture for the purpose of making this preferred end times doctrine work out seems dubious at best to me. And then there is the issue 
of God patterns. Never in the history of the Bible has the Lord removed His people from the midst of persecution and tribulation. Never. Rather, they, we, have suffered through it by our ever more reliance upon God's grace. Only after the oppression, or perhaps to end the oppression, does the Lord turn His wrath upon the people who harshly treated His elect, and He did it for the sake of His justice. Therefore, in addition to needing a gross restructuring of the Bible itself, God's pattern of allowing His people to go through tribulation, that would have to be broken in order for us to find in Revelation an assured escape for Christians from the ravages of oppression and tribulation that is coming for the entire world. And as much as I hope I'm wrong, and they're right, because you know what? I'd much rather not go through the oppression and tribulation. I can't find any scriptural basis to adopt the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. I can only find every reason not to. Besides, as I demonstrated in earlier lessons, there are no such things in the Bible as named events called the tribulation and the great tribulation. These are human literary inventions that were needed to create a new doctrine about the timing of the rapture. My research shows that such a concept never even existed among the early church fathers who commented on John's book of Revelation. In fact, history tells us it was John Nelson Darby of Darby Bible fame in 1827, less than 200 years ago, who first came up with the concept of named in times events called the Tribulation and the Great Tribulation. Did you know that? Because those are the keystones of his new pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. That's where it all came from. 1827. Now, since I don't agree with Darby, for the present, we shall proceed with chapters 6 and 7, not only remaining right where we find them, but also with the events spoken of in them remaining in the chronological order that we find them. I just can't find any criteria, at least I can't so far, to question their order that requires us to reshuffle the deck. Excuse me while I fiddle with this thing on my ear. I cannot get it to stay in place this morning. My jaws are moving too much. In chapter 7, verse 1, John says that he saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Now, this represents the way that the ancients imagined the earth as more or less a square, and therefore it has corners. Ancient Israelites generally agree with that thinking, but they also conceived of Jerusalem as the earth's center. The number four in the Bible regularly symbolizes the four compass directions. Therefore, usually when we find the number four in Scripture, the intent is to indicate that the action is inclusive of the entire planet. In our case, the scene is of four unnamed, unclassified angels, and they are in charge of the winds that blow across our planet. Now, these four angels, they're ordered to hold back the winds so that no wind at all would blow across our continental land masses or over the seas and oceans. Now, here, once again, it is common among Bible commentators to resort to allegory in their interpretation. 
if there is such a thing as majority opinion on this passage, it is that the four winds are not actual wind, not actual movement of air, but rather it represents four spirits. And there's a couple of reasons for this. First, in Hebrew, the term ruach means both spirit and wind. So the context has to help us determine which of those two meanings to apply. Second, if we can take the meaning of wind as figurative of spirit, then we can connect that to the four horsemen of chapter 6 that are spirits. Since decidedly, those four horsemen are not real, physical, tangible men and horses. That theory works, provided we ignore the last half of verse 1. Because there it says, so that no wind would blow on the land, on the sea, or on any tree. Sure sounds like wind to me. It becomes rather nonsensical to insist that we should say that no spirit is what it's talking about. We'd have to be saying no spirit would blow on the land, the sea, or any tree. That doesn't even make sense. So wind is the correct translation. It's the logical meaning. What is being predicted is that literally all winds on our planet suddenly cease for a protracted period of time. How might such a weather event affect us? Well, in the days when all ocean transportation of goods and people were on wind-powered sailing vessels, there was little greater fear than experiencing a doldrums. And a doldrums is that complete stagnation of moving air. That meant that a ship's only movement might be on account of drifting with whatever ocean current they might be in. There are many sea tales of ships remaining in a doldrums for so long that much of the crew went mad, committed mutiny, even starved to death. Further, this absence of wind meant no storms would blow in so that they could not get the rain they counted on to replenish their drinking water. Our planet's weather is completely held hostage to the winds. If the winds everywhere were to cease, the Earth's unequal heating distribution would eventually result in a huge increase in the temperature differences between our frigid poles and our hot equator, as well as between the land and the sea. Eventually to the point where most of the Earth's surface would not be able to support life as we know it. Cold regions would become extremely cold. Warm regions would become extremely hot. So when this stoppage of airflow worldwide happens, it's going to be devastating to nature and to humans. Well, verse 2 speaks of another and a different angel. This one is said to come from the east. Why east? Ezekiel 43.1. After this he brought me to the gate facing east, and there I saw the glory of the God of Israel approaching from the east. His voice was like the sound of rushing water, and the earth shone with his glory. See, east is always the most important direction in the Bible. East was the traditional direction from which the divine manifestation came. The temple on earth faces east. <clears throat> so just as numbers have significance and often form a repeating pattern in the Bible, so do compass directions. This new angel brought with him a seal from God and told the four angels who controlled all the winds on the planet to just wait a little while before they held back those winds. 
until this other angel had a chance to seal God's servants on their foreheads. <clears throat> now those who would be sealed numbered 144,000. And we're told they come from every tribe of the people of Israel. Now once again, Bible commentators go multiple directions on trying to discern just who this 144,000 is. Should this be taken literally or symbolically? If there's anything approaching a majority opinion, it is that the number and the people who get sealed are symbolic. That is, it will be an unspecified number of people that get sealed and protected, but they will not be Israelites. They will be Gentile Christians. They will be the church. Now, there are several aspects of these passages to discuss. But first, what does it mean to be sealed? Actually, there's no consensus on this. But, if we were to use the Bible to define itself, which is usually the best option, then we must look at a similar passage also found in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 9.1 Then he cried loudly right into my ears, Summon the commanders of the city, each holding his weapon of destruction. At once, six men approached on the path from the upper gate to the north, each man holding his weapon of destruction. Now among them, was a man clothed in linen, with a scribe's writing equipment at his waist. They entered and they stood by the bronze altar. Then the glory of God, of the God of Israel, was made to go up from over the cherub, the cherubim, where it had been, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen, who had the scribe's writing equipment at his waist. And Adonai said to him, Go throughout the city, out throughout all Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who are sighing and crying over all these disgusting practices that are being committed in it. Now to the others I heard him say, Go through the city after him and strike, and don't let your eye spare. Have no pity. Kill old men, young men, girls, little children, women, slaughter them all. But don't go near anyone with the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. They began with the leaders in front of the house. See, the usual use for a seal in ancient times was for a king or an aristocrat to claim his ownership over something by affixing his recognized personal name to it. This was essentially a no trespassing sign. So in the Ezekiel passage, before all these people were to be killed at God's orders, mostly Israelites by the way, living in Jerusalem, those who refuse to participate in the idolatry of their brothers were to be set apart for God by a mark that was to be placed on their foreheads by, I guess, what must have been angels. Then, the, then other angels were to go throughout the city killing everyone, including women and children, even priests and Levites. But they were not to harm anyone with God's mark on them. It seems clear enough to me that we should apply the general meaning of that Ezekiel passage to our understanding of Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, about the sealing. Now, as for the number, 144,000, it's a very specific number. And how exactly that number or was arrived at, well, that's spelled out for us. It consists of 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, there can be no good reason to allegorize the 144,000. 
nor is there any reasonable context in which to make it figurative. It means what it says. That said, anytime we find large round numbers in the Bible, we aren't to take them as precise. That is, perhaps, for example, 11,920 will be the actual number from one tribe and 12,240 from another. And the 144,000 may not be precise, just very, very close. This, this desire for absolute precision of numbers is modern Western thinking. It's not how the ancients thought about it. Further, we find this group of 144,000 mentioned again later on in Revelation in chapter 14, 1. Then I looked, and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So there can be no doubt that Revelation 7, 4 and 14, 1 are referring to the same group of people. And since a seal is for declaring ownership, so we see in Revelation 14, 1, that the 144,000 are owned, so to speak, by the Lamb and by the Father. So who are these who are sealed? Now, you would think that not only since we're explicitly told that these are from every tribe of Israel, but also each of the tribes is listed by name, and the number sealed is also listed, it's the same amount for each tribe, that the matter would be settled. But no. <laughs> Mainstream Christianity claims, why the 140,000, 144,000 cannot be Israelites? They're Gentile Christians. Now, G.K. Beale, who is an excellent scholar, who's published perhaps the most authoritative Christian Bible commentary on the book of Revelation, of course addresses the important matter of the identity of this 144,000. I'm going to make an extensive quote because one of the most controversial issues within Revelation is exactly who that 144,000 is. As some of you might know, for many decades, Jehovah's Witnesses claimed they're the 144,000. Here's what Professor Beale says, and I quote, The community of the redeemed in Revelation 7, 3 through 8 is the same as in 14, 1 through 4 because of the verbal parallels and ideas observed above. In 14, 3 and 4, the 144,000 are those who had been purchased from among men as first fruits to God. And there is a parallel between 14.4 and 5.9, which is so close that the groups mentioned as purchased in both are probably identical. In 5.9, the lamb purchased for God men from every tribe and tongue, tongue and people and nation. This would mean that the 144,000 in 14.1 through 3 are not some small remnant of ethnic Israelites but another way of speaking of the larger remnant of humanity living during the church age, whom Christ redeemed from throughout the world. If this identification is correct, then the 144,000 uh, in Revelation 7, 3, 3, 8 must, must also represent the same redeemed remnant from all over the earth. This group is numbered as 144,000 to emphasize figuratively that this is a picture of the church in its entirety. In other words, Beale says that since Revelation 14, 3 and 4, the 144,000 is identified as those who had been purchased among men as the first fruits to God, he then concludes this can't be talking about people from Israel. In his view, this can't include Jews, Jesus' own people. I mean, Think about what he's saying. He is saying that Gentile Christians are the first fruits to God. 
and that the thousands upon thousands of believing Jews going back to the original Pentecost are not. All we have to do is read the Gospels. Read the book of Acts to know that it was Jews, a.k.a. Israelites, who were the first to become believers in Christ and thus became the first fruits to God. But Beal removes this distinction from Israel, hands it over to the Gentile church in a rather strange twist of logic. This, by the way, is the definition and the rationale behind replacement theology. Even more, while Beale determines he can reasonably turn to his own speculation about who the 144,000 are in Revelation 14, because the answer we find in that verse doesn't identify any specific group of people by name, he also, for some reason, chooses to ignore Revelation 7, 3 through 8, where the 144,000 are specifically identified as the people of Israel, and then are identified in even more detail by listing them tribe by tribe. Instead of taking the detailed and specific identity given to us about the 144,000 in Revelation 7, 3 through 8, which comes first, and then apply it to 14, 3, he does the opposite. He applies his speculation about Revelation 14 back to Revelation 7, where no speculation is needed because the people are pinpointed as being from the 12 tribes of Israel. Seriously. Folks, this is the mainstream doctrine that's out there today. See, if it was only Beal to detour to this odd path, then we could scratch our heads and say, you know what, everybody's entitled to his or her position. We must move on from it. But this all so happens to be the majority position of the mainstream Protestant and Catholic Church. And folks, it is a distortion of plain scriptural truth to search for some other identity of the 144,000 because the one given to, the, given to us in the Bible is not acceptable to church leadership. Just as we have a duty to spread the good news about salvation in Christ, we also have a duty to discredit this heretical replacement doctrine of Christianity that denies Israel her place in redemption history. It is virtually taken as a given in most denominations and never seriously challenged. Be that as it may, <laughs> there is a problem here that we can't just ignore if we're going to be honest about it. The problem is that two tribes look at your Bibles, two tribes are conspicuously absent from this, this listing of 12. And one tribe, Manesha, is essentially being, getting double billing because of the mention of the tribe of Joseph. Joseph was Manesha's father. Now, let's address this in some detail because I know it's been a long time since many of you have studied the Torah with me, where the tribes are discussed in detail. Jacob, who's Abraham's grandson, was given a new name and identity by God, Israel. So Israel and Jacob are two names for the same person. Israel married two sisters, Leah and Rachel, and also took on two concubines. And from the wives and concubines, 12 sons were produced. And these 12 sons went on to become the founders and namesakes of the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 tribes of Jacob. 
However, because of a famine where they were living in Canaan and other parts of the Middle East and Northern Africa, Jacob moved his family to Egypt and to a happy reuniting with the son that he thought he'd lost forever, Joseph. Well, as Jacob got very old, he wanted to bestow the traditional blessing upon his two grandsons, the two sons of Joseph. Their names were Ephraim and Manasseh. But to Joseph's shock, Jacob not only blessed them, he adopted them as his own sons. So for a time down in Egypt, there were essentially 14 tribes of Israel. The original 12 sons of Jacob, plus now his two grandchildren, which he has taken away from Jacob and elevated them to his own children, his own sons. So now on his deathbed, he calls all of his sons to him and he pronounces a prophetic blessing upon them all. And in that family blessing, Jacob took tribal authority away from Joseph. He handed it over to his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Why he did that is not stated. So the 14 tribes of Israel down in Egypt was reduced by one. Now there's 13 tribes of Israel. When Israel fled from Egypt, there were 13 tribes of Israel. Later on, during their exodus, God removed the tribe of Levi from among the ranks of Israel. He set them apart as a tribe of priests just dedicated to serve him. The Lord specifically stated, Levi was no longer to be counted among his brothers, that is, among the other tribes of Israel. Thus, the 13 tribes was reduced by one more. Now they're back to 12 tribes. So when the Exodus ended and Israel entered the Promised Land, it was with 12 tribes, but this 12 tribes was not the same 12 as originally constituted. Joseph was no longer among them, neither was Levi. Ephraim and Manasseh effectively replaced them. All throughout Israelite history, from the time they entered Canaan right up through today, it is that modified group of 12 tribes that is the 12 tribes of Israel. However, here in Revelation chapter 7, we get yet another modification to the makeup of the 12 tribes. For some unstated reason, the tribes of Dan and Ephraim are no longer included. But the tribe of Levi is reinstated, and Joseph has also been readmitted to the group. Now, there's been much speculation among Jews and Gentile Christians as to why this might be. And as with most of the controversies surrounding the book of Revelation, there's no consensus. I'm not even sure there's a majority opinion on the matter. However, as I conducted my research, I'd have to say that most modern Bible scholars and a handful of earlier ones have con concluded that, that very probably this is either John getting it wrong oh yeah or it's a scribal error that is whatever Greek version is the latest one that our New Testaments are taken from this list contains errors. In truth, though, it is not uncommon that when Bible scholars can't find an answer to a biblical problem that they can reasonably defend, scriptural error is usually their solution. Now, I have serious doubts that there is scribal error, nor do I think John got it wrong. For one reason, since we find a few changes to the tribal makeup in the Old Testament. 
over time. Shouldn't be so surprising for us to see it again in Revelation. For another reason, to think that John was not aware of the various iterations of the 12 tribes over the centuries and all the traditions associated with it, that's just unthinkable. And as concerns later copying of the book of Revelation, the Old Testament makes researching and finding the actual makeup of the 12 tribes and how it changed over the centuries a pretty easy task. It's not hard. So an error would have been quickly noticed. So we're going to proceed assuming the tribal listing here in Revelation to be correct Understanding that just as with the first time the tribal makeup was altered by Jacob, we are not told why. That said, we do need to leave the door just slightly ajar in case some much earlier copy of the book of Revelation than we have now might get discovered and the tribal listing might be different or it more resembles Ezekiel's millennial kingdom tribal listing. I'm not expecting this to happen, but you never know. We'll continue with chapter 7 next time.